Hey everybody, it's Chuck from Gaming Nexus. Uh, remember Path to Exile is a uh, free-to-play isometric adventure game that looked a lot like Diablo uh, that came out way back in 2013? Well, did you know that the game is still around and thriving? Um, since the launch of the game, the team at uh, Grinding Gear Games has been cranking out expansion packs left and right, growing the world and making a bigger place. Anyway, later this year, the team is going to be releasing one of the biggest expansion packs to date, and to get the information on what you can be able to expect in that pack, we sat down and talked to Chris Wilson, the CEO of the company, to get an idea of what players can expect when the pack hits later this year. Be sure to let me know what you think of the com interview in the comments. We're here to talk about is Path of Exile The Fall of Oriath, and it's our sixth expansion to Path of Exile since it's launched in 2013. Okay. So if you go through to slide number two, this is the only slide with words on it, I promise, okay. so most of them are audio-visual ones. So Path of Exile grew substantially in 2016. It was already popular, but it's becoming more so. Uh, the number of player hours increased by 44% last year. And we had over a million active players in December. And the reason we're quoting this in terms of active players, which is people who play during the month of December mm -hmm. on our servers, is that it's very easy for games to uh, run away into the you know hundreds of millions of registered users where none of them are actually playing the game anymore. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make it clear that we have a very strong community at the moment, the largest it's ever been with Path of Exile, with over a million uh, people engaged in December, plus several hundred thousand people playing on servers that we don't directly control, like uh, the Taiwan servers in Thailand and so okay. on. And we released two expansions last year, which both did well. Uh, on slide number three, we have two new markets coming in 2017, which are both in addition to the content that I wanted to talk about today. This is kind of just setting the scene of what's okay. going on in the background. So this path of Exile China that you can see on the left, we're releasing that with the help of Tencent, a large internet company in China, targeting roughly the middle of the year for the big release there. And we're very optimistic about this because... They have this site in China where players vote uh, and compete a lot on which games are going to be, uh, which are the most anticipated games coming out. And Path of Exile finished 2016 at the number one slot. Nice. So we're quite happy with that. Uh, it, it shows that it's probably going to be pretty successful in China, which is a, a good market to be big in. I heard they got some and people the, over there. Yeah, they do. It's, it's one of those things where we're just going to dwarf the number of people that have ever played Path of Exile before is about to double when China gets their hands on it. So mm. it should be quite interesting. There's also the Xbox One release later this year, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that uh, because all of the content that's coming out here on the PC version that I'm showing you is also coming out at the Xbox One release, so it includes the full Path of Exile experience right up to date with PC. Okay. And there were interesting challenges, both technical and gameplay, regarding that port that I'm happy to talk about it if it's of interest to your viewers. Otherwise, we can talk about the PC version. Definitely. I mean, you want to talk about the Xbox version now or you want to wait till later? I'm completely happy to discuss it whenever. How about I go through the other content, just so you've got yeah. more like background, and then feel free to ask any Xbox or PC or both questions. Great. Okay. Cool, okay. And then so slide number four has the logo for the Fall of Oriath. Now, okay. this means something to our players. They don't yet know the title, of course, because it's embargoed, but Oriath in the backstory is the place that the players come from. It's kind of their homeland. It's a small island off the coast of the big continent, and... Uh, something bad happened to the continent a few hundred years earlier, so everyone got wiped out and there were lots of monsters and so on. And Oriath was rem remained unaffected uh, by this, so it continued its little cloistered society. And it kind of had this rule that whenever there was a criminal that they wanted to execute, instead they would exile them to the mainland, because it's basically a death penalty, but mm -hmm. it's a lot better in the eyes of their religion and so on. So the player's been exiled due to various crimes to Rayclast, and so far in the story, Path of Exile players have played through quite a lot of the Rayclast content, you know, uh, getting a chance to assassinate the person who directly exiled them, as well as dealing with some other problems, and now it's the time for them to try to return back to where they came from, and as you can see from the title, the fall of Arya hints at the fact that it's not going to go particularly well for your homeland. So there's the, the plot backstory. I actually have a trailer that I can show you if you're interested. It's about um, a minute and a half long, if okay. you want to see that.
backstory for what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay. And there's uh, some interesting uh, decisions that led to certain things there. Like you'll notice that in addition to talking about Act 5, it also refers to Act 6 through 10. Mm -hmm. And that's something that our players are certainly not expecting. They know that we're introducing a fifth act to the game, but had no idea that the uh, that there was a possibility that we would actually um, revamp the rest of the game to such a large degree. And so that's one of the things I wanted to discuss today. Okay. Cool. So if you go through to slide number five, there's a video that you can play on that slide. It's got no sound. The idea okay. is that we can just talk over it while it's okay. playing. So let me know when that's going. Yep, it's gone. Cool. So at the end of Act 4, the player finds out there's a chance they can return back to their homeland, and they're told that they need to climb up snowy Mount Barusa, which is shown here, and there's an ability to like teleport back to Oriath. And so they're kind of hoping for a quiet retirement, because they've dealt with all the enemies they thought they needed to deal with. So upon arriving back on Oriath, they find themselves in the middle of a slave revolution, because some of their actions uh, previously in the plot have led to the slaves gaining some power that allows them to revolt against their overlords in Oriath. And the players sympathetic towards this because they themselves were held captive by these people before they were exiled. And so they helped the slave revolution to overthrow the order of high Templars who are controlling Oriath. And these are the same people that exiled the players, so of course they have a lot of motivation there. And so the beginning of the act is playing through the slave areas, trying to deal with overseers and to basically get out to the city proper. And this, uh, the early tile sets are very reminiscent of other parts of Path of Exile that we've done, as in they're very gritty and grungy. From an art point of view, they're kind of very lived-in areas. Whereas the rest of the city, like this city square here, and the various ornate temples and so on, are different than the kind of art that we normally make, because they're meant to be pristine. Like, this is a city that's well-maintained, it's very wealthy, it has a, you know, a very um, religion-centric population who like to have very nice temples and so on. And so the artists had an interesting challenge with this to try to make a very kind of new, nice aesthetic for the city as opposed to the very lived-in, uh, grungy one that we normally use for the rest of the game where we cake on blood and dirt to make it feel like it's 200 years old. And so there were interesting challenges with that. The other thing I wanted to show you, which is coming up just after this area, is one of the mid-act boss fights in the game. And we've really evolved the way that we do boss fights in Path of Exile over the years. They kind of started out where you take a monster, make him a bit bigger, give him a glow and a special name and call him a boss, but now uh, it's got a lot more interesting. So if you go through to slide six and let me know when that's okay. playing and we can talk about that. Okay, it's playing now. So this is the boss fight against High Templar Avarius, who's basically the guy in charge of the Templar Order. Now this boss fight is one of the 24 boss fights we're adding in the expansion, and most of them, like this one, are multi-stage complicated fights where there are many, many, many skills used by the bosses, and they typically add more skills throughout the fight as the player gets used to them. So he starts off shooting small yellow projectiles at you, and he has a beam attack that he does occasionally. But he gets more power, such as the ability to animate these statues, uh, which walk around, and they're very dangerous, you don't want to let them get near you. But an interesting property of these statues is once they become unanimated, they kind of stand there like a big stone pillar, and this enables you to hide behind them later in the fight when he's doing various bullet hell mechanics. And so the player can learn how to combine the boss abilities uh, together in a way that makes the fight easier for themselves. And so this is actually a multi-stage encounter as well, where once you kill Avarius, uh, he kind of transforms to show the fact that he's being possessed by uh, a character called the God Innocence. And so this is an important turning point in the plot, because up until this point, the uh, Ray Clastian gods have no influence on the world, and so the fact that Innocence is able to possess this High Templar means some very significant stuff for the players, which I'll get into later in the discussion. Okay. So this fight is uh, relatively indicative of the complexity and quality of the boss fights in this expansion. It's a relatively... Uh, it's, it's kind of an obvious one because it's in the middle of Act 5, so all the players are going to see it. Many of the boss fights are optional ones, which you can kind of find if you explore side areas and so on. And there are some mechanics that I'll talk about later where, about how you get rewarded for tracking down all of the bosses and killing them. And so I think this bit here in the video shows the bullet hell kind of thing where you yeah, have to dodge behind the statue to, to yeah. save it. And that is a lot harder than it looks, honestly. I, yeah. The number of times I was demoing that this week and my character <laughs> got slaughtered repetitively and I should theoretically know how to play it. So it is quite tough. Yeah. But then it's, uh, it's something where players can learn the mechanics and get through it. So, um, slide 7 is a slide that I put together in MS Paint that's meant to illustrate why we've switched to having a 10-act structure for the game. Mm -hmm. So, one of the tropes of old-school action RPGs, like Diablo 1 and 2 and Titan Quest and that kind of thing, is that they would have difficulty levels where you repeat the game, say, three times, and it gets harder each time. It's like New Game Plus, for example. Mm -hmm. 
obviously an easy thing for the developers to add and it extends the game. So when we came to make Path of Exile, we did exactly the same thing because it's how action RPGs work. And then as we developed our Atlas of Worlds endgame, which is the map system in the game where players can play through randomized areas and find more maps to play and complete various objectives, we put that on the end. So you play through the game three times. In doing so, you learn enough information and your character's developed enough that you can play the Atlas of Worlds endgame. And that's great. People love Atlas of Worlds and they love the game itself, but they're not so much in love with playing through it three times before the end. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we needed content there to give them enough time to develop their characters to be able to handle the Atlas of Worlds stuff. And so we found that once a player gets to the Atlas of Worlds endgame, there's really good player retention. Like, that player's with us forever, basically. Likewise, when they're playing through the initial storyline, there's a pretty good chance they're going to see their way through the whole story. You know, the retention rate for any kind of, um, you know, single-player experience, as it were. I mean, this is an online game, but in yeah. terms of playing through Acts 1 through 4, it's pretty normal player retention. However, there's an opportunity for players to leave when they finish the first playthrough basically told, hey, congratulations, you've finished the game, but now play through it again twice, and then you get to the juicy part that everyone's talking about on Reddit. And there's mm -hmm. the opportunity for people to say, well, I've seen your game, I'm going to go play something else now. So we wanted to address this with this expansion. And the motivation here was that because we have so many new players coming in with both the Xbox launch and the China launch and this expansion launch on PC, it's a good opportunity to finally fix what we see as the biggest leak in the game. So the way it works now is that there's Acts 1 through 4, exactly where they were before, and then you play Act 5, which is the new one that I showed you. Uh, I've showed you part of Act 5 so far, of course, it's quite a lot longer. And then Act 6 to 10. Now, these continue the story on. So towards the end of Act 5, you find out there's a reason why you need to return back to Rayclast on the mainland and to do some various activities that allow you to um, complete the plot completely. And so in Acts 6 through 10, you revisit familiar areas from the past by going back to Rayclast and going through a similar kind of uh, progression that you did initially, but, it's, but a lot of stuff is different. So the areas um, are at least somewhat different, if not completely different. The monsters have new abilities and so on. The bosses are totally new. The quests are completely new. And it's basically an homage to the original game where you can find out what kind of stuff changed as a result of your actions. I can show you a video with a comparison of various different areas if okay. you'd like to see specifically how that looks. So go through to slide 8 and let me know when that's playing. Okay, I'm there. It's playing. Great. So this one here shows various areas in comparison to each other. There's the initial starting town area, which uh, has been modified so that there's quite a lot of new structures built since you were last there. The uh, initial um, area where you would fight zombies until you get to the first boss fight is now an optional side area where the zombies are Placed by washed up dead people from the planet. The shores of the coast, the Karori tribes have moved in, and now have been the themed around these ancient tribes. They revamped stuff in the uh, the mudflats, for example, to add new types of um, architecture there that you'll notice. Once you're finished in the mudflats, the fetid pool has been drained and is instead replaced with the, Kar the Karori fortress, where the Karori tribes have made it all nice and verdant. You get a boss fight against uh, the Tukahama minor god instead of going through a cave system and this continues where from this point it gets relatively divergent you go along the ridge rather than the ledge which is on the other side of the mountain to find your way into a prison that you've previously explored instead of going down the um the prison to the deepest depths in order to find the prison warden brutus you get to climb to the top where there's a tower where you fight both brutus who's been reincarnated and put back together again and also chevron who's the spellcaster who put him back together again you can fight them together and then there's a road where previously it was blocked, but this time you've unblocked it in the previous playthrough, and so there's a chance to get into the uh, forest content a lot earlier than you normally would do. And this continues. Um, so the goal here with the playthrough is that the player is getting to see locations that they've been to in the past, but what they're doing in them and the order that they play them and what they look like is completely different. And so it's basically like a big fan service thing where players can find out what happened after they left. There are characters that were intending to do stuff, you get to see how that went, there are characters missing and you get to try to find them and track them down and see what changed with the environment. And this of course leads through to a completely new climactic boss encounter at the end of the act against the Brine King who's a, a god that's risen up and I'll talk about why there are gods rising in a second. So in summary, uh, the change here results in Path of Exile being a 10 act playthrough. And that means that instead of you playing exactly the same four acts three times, you now have the unique storyline that goes through the ten acts before you get to the endgame systems. And this will dramatically improve player retention because there isn't a point where they get told, okay, now do that thing again twice more. That's a great idea. So you basically use all the metrics behind the system to see where players were hopping out of the game and then just kind of using this to kind of keep them engaged. 
Absolutely, yeah. And the second set of five acts are completely based on the first set. Like, you know, without a doubt, there's some asset reuse going on here. But the degree to which they're being changed is very high. So I would say it feels like 70 or 80 percent completely new, with the remaining 20 or 30 percent being an homage to the original, which is hopefully cool to experience rather than feeling repetitive. Mm. And so far in our testing, like we've pulled some players over to New Zealand and sat them down and said, play this and tell us what you think. Mm. And their reactions are extremely positive especially if they cared about the detail of the story because there's so many little touches that the writers put in the uh, second part that um, call back to the first one. Okay, cool. Alrighty, so go through to slide number nine. This shows the Pantheon image. So this depicts all of the various gods of Rayclast, and there are a lot of them. But what's interesting that the players have actually noticed is until now these gods haven't really had any kind of influence on the world. And the reason why is there was an entity that the players got to deal with in Act 4, actually, around a year or so ago, called the Beast. And one of the things that the Beast was doing was sapping all of the divine powers of the gods, and so because of this they had no way of influencing the world. So after the player slew the Beast, it's meant that these gods have gradually been able to regain their power and rise up again. And this is one of the major themes in the second playthrough. Starting at the point that you fight High Templar Avarius, who's that guy that I showed you before, from that point onwards you begin to notice that there is the influence of various gods in the world. They're vying for their traditional domains that they had control over. And so in the second playthrough you actually get to fight against 16 different gods, uh, those four major and 12 minor ones, and can steal a fraction of their power when you kill them. And this can be seen in slide number 10. This is a mock-up of the user interface there. It's not 100% final. Um, but basically it shows there's the Pantheon image and there are four gods towards the top and twelve towards the bottom. And upon killing a god, you have the ability to select his powers on the screen. And you're allowed to have one major and one minor power active at any time. Now, each of the gods grants a different thing. For example, the Brine King, who's shown on this panel here, uh, says that if you've been stunned, you can't be stunned again for a little while, and the same with being frozen. And this means that chain stuns and chain freezes don't affect you, um, at least the subsequent ones don't. Now this is a relatively subtle thing, but it makes a big difference in certain boss encounters. And so there are a total of 16 of these abilities, and you can select the two. But what makes them different than normal Path of Exile abilities is the fact that you can change them very easily. You just go to town and click on a new one, and then it's active. This is important because normally there's a high degree of lock-in with choice in Path of Exile. If you put some skills on the passive skill tree, or you make a decision about what you're doing in your quests, then that generally stays with your character for a long time. It's quite difficult to change. But with this system, you can change it very easily by just going to town and clicking a button. And so this means that players have a high degree of agency with regard to kind of defending against certain types of uh, damage. For example, if you and your friends are going to go and play a very difficult fire map where there's an antagonist there who's going to do a lot of fire damage, then it's a good idea for you to pick a set of uh, you know, anti-fire abilities from the Pantheon system prior to doing that map. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right, so that is the, uh, that's the summary of the main part of the expansion. So we were going to add Act 5 and call it a day, but we decided mm -hmm. that adding Act 6 through 10 to fully fix the last thing that we saw is wrong with the game would be a sensible thing to include. And we also have the Pantheon system that allows you to both track your progress through the second part with which gods you've killed and also to gain a facet of their powers. Now, there's plenty of other items and skills and that kind of stuff that we're adding into the expansion, but they're somewhat small compared to the scope of these larger issues. There is one other thing I wanted to show you in the press tour, and that's on slide number 11. Okay. So this actually is unrelated to this big expansion, but it is something that we're doing quite soon. So we have a three-month schedule of these challenge leagues that we release, and there is a new challenge league starting in a few weeks. And these are kind of, well, you can think of them as like a three-month server that you get to play in where your characters have to be created fresh on the server. And so this is called the Legacy one, and it's basically celebrating the past of Path of Exile because uh, there's a whole bunch of new stuff happening later this year. So our target for the Fall of Oriath, which is the expansion I've been talking to you about, we're targeting the middle of the year, so roughly June would be a good guess of when it's coming out, that we don't want to commit to an exact date. Mm -hmm. And we do have a beta for it coming, probably late April or early May, which uh, people will get a chance to play. And so the Legacy Challenge League kind of fills the gaps between now and then, allowing players to revisit some of the existing game mechanics in Path of Exile. And the way it works is it lets you combine together your favorite three of the past 17 challenge leagues that we've run. So you can finally answer the question of which one of the leagues from the past uh, has the fastest leveling potential and so on. And it also lets you find items from those previous leagues that were only available then. Okay. So the final slide just reiterates the embargo date of tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific. Okay. So there's the whirlwind overview of what's going in the expansion and that league, and I'm sure you probably have questions about all of this stuff. Okay, yeah. 
So um, uh, it looks really solid. So I mean, you've really done a job. So you're really kind of planning out of giving, giving essentially, you know, fresh red meat to the existing people with the Act Five, and then you're obviously then and then giving them the ability to go back and play a lot of the same content in a modified way with chapter six through ten. Essentially, they're your chance to re-experience that stuff, and then you're adding this whole new level, new ability with the god powers, where they can and uh -huh. are much easier to essentially respect and uh, tweak the players a bit to kind of figure out what they really want and how to deal with it. Is that a correct assessment? Yes, that is certainly. Okay. We we want where possible the game to feel like a ten act storyline mm -hmm. where it's cool that players are going back to rivers at previous locations. And I mean, previously it was exactly the same content that you played through, and they generally tolerated it pretty well. But there were certainly players that didn't stomach it. And those same players now, when sat in front of the new revamped areas, like the new touches. You know, it does it does feel like quite a different playthrough, especially because the tone of the game is different. It's very much about finding these gods that are just devastating stuff and killing them, rather than the relatively aimless wander through the game that was initially there in the first version okay so you're really focusing on the on the second on the on six through ten you're really focusing on hunting down killing the gods taking their powers right is that correct? right okay yep the game's also very the game that part of the game there is also very well designed for players who know what they're doing at that point because as you can imagine if you play through the you know how we had it so you play through the game three times and mm -hmm. it's identical that means that you end up playing through like almost the tutorial areas even though you know what you're doing like on the third playthrough you're playing through this really easy beginning of the game where the monsters do a lot of damage because it's the third playthrough but their ai is really dumb like mm -hmm. they walk around like zombies slowly and it's kind of weird in this case here we know the player knows what they're doing by the time they get to the second set of content and so it just feels completely different cool that was a lot of the questions I had about the thing. I guess let me, let me back that up. G kind of looking back at what you've done between when the, when the game launched in 2013 and and, when, and now, what do you feel like has been the biggest success? What would you can, uh, kind of say has been the reason for your success? I think we have a a really supportive community, and we have kind of fell into a cadence with them that works really well. So we're releasing content every three months, and every second big content release has an expansion to go with it. And we found that the community basically all return to see every release that we do. They'll play it for however long it interests them, which may be in some cases the whole three months, in some cases it's two of the months, in some cases it's the first day, you know, depending on how much they want to see. And so we fell into this rhythm with them where we know that when we release content, we're going to have a lot of player engagement. And this works well for the community as well because they can treat Path of Exile as a game that they're just going to play perpetually for the next 10 years whenever it interests them to play. Like every three months, they'll come back and check it out for however long that is. And over time, we're seeing more and more engagement with each one of those three-month cycles as we gradually work out the right type of content to give them. But it's a really good relationship here because we don't have to worry about... Like we can provide a different and interesting content each time without having to fall into a specific formula. Okay. And I can come up with a specific example of that. Sure. We wanted to add this labyrinth to the game, like a crazy death dungeon kind of thing that you can only play, like you, if you die at any point during it, you have to start the whole mm -hmm. thing again, and it shifts randomly every day, and it's just completely orthogonal to the rest of the game content. It's basically just this gigantic labyrinth that was there because we wanted to make it. And so we released that last March, and it's a thing that the players... I mean, some of the players said, I don't want to play this. Some of the players absolutely loved it. But the fact that we released it on a schedule with our normal leagues meant that people were able to try it out. And it got a lot of, a lot of um, good feedback from the players. And it let our design team add stuff to the game that they wouldn't have done if they were entirely beholden to, um, to releasing un like, to really safe, non-experimental mm -hmm. stuff, if you see what I mean. Like, it let yeah. us do something that was artistically interesting as opposed to something that had to be a guaranteed hit with the players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always the hard part is how do you kind of balance, you know, experimenting and getting stale and getting outside of that, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Right. Um, Certainly. And we, we like to vary the expansions we release so they target different things. And this one here is very much about targeting the storyline of the core game. It's the biggest update in terms of actual core story that we've ever done. Okay. Do you have a release window for this, for the uh, Act 5? We're targeting uh, the middle of the year. I suspect it will be early June, but we'd rather not lock it into that exact time. Okay. There'll be a beta, late April, early May. And like the rest of the game, the expansion is free to play. Uh, the only things that we sell on Path of Exile are cosmetic microtransactions and some long-term storage space. There's nothing that directly benefits your actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in terms of power level. Mm -hmm. 
Um, is this going out? This is part of the 3.0 patch, correct? That's correct, yes. Yep. Are there any other kind of quality of life enhancements or other things that are going out as part of this patch? We we generally decide the quality of life stuff a bit closer to release okay. because at the moment we're focusing, and the reason for this is at the moment we're focusing on making sure we can hit everything we need for release. And then when we look at how much development time we have left, we pick the top community voted quality of life things to release. Uh, we're actually, the other thing is we're heavily incentivized by the community to release the quality of life stuff as soon as it's ready. So some of the things that we've been working on recently are going to go in this, what's called 260 launch, which is a few weeks from now. That's the one that has a legacy challenge league. And so we don't like delaying quality of life stuff mm -hmm. all the way until um, June, if we can avoid it, when we could release it a few weeks from now. Okay. Good practice. Yep. An example of something we are fixing in 3.0.0 is completely revamping how the microtransaction system works in terms of how you store them. Because by this point, some of our biggest spenders have very large quantities of microtransactions that they can put on their items to change how they look and so on. And it's a bit messy to deal with them in that quantity. Mm -hmm. So we're revamping this to make it a lot nicer. Cool. I'd like to thank Chris again for taking the time to talk to us about the new content. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you like it. And I hope you have a great day. Bye.